All right, I think we're about to get started. It's, it feels good, third day, and I already feel like, with my deep air conditioning voice, um, making sure I'm not losing it. Yesterday, I think I presented 45 minute session in the evening, and I couldn't almost get air. It was just done. But for today, I slept well. I'm here for you guys. We do VXLAN, BGB, EVP, and multi-site an architecture and technology overview. And my name is Lucas Kradiger, and I will bring you through that session in 45 minutes, hopefully. I'll give my best. Um, abstract, I'm not going to read it, but number one, which I want to emphasize, is the important note. I'm talking about NXOS, talking about VXLAN EVPN. It's not ACI, right? That, we leave that to Max. He needs, by the way, 90 minutes to cover the same stuff, which I do in 45 minutes. So the Swiss efficiency versus the Italian. Um, Max, are you here? He's probably still asleep, but we leave it to him. Um, the week gets to an end, but we still have a lot of material which is going on. Um, we are here somewhere at Wednesday. You see the yellow session there. You're sitting in there, VXLAN, BGB, EVP, and multi-site. We have a couple of more session. Um, going on. Later in the day, we do multicast in VXLAN EVPN, if you're interested, or then we do uh, tomorrow packet walks. Um, first, I give the general packet walk in VXLAN EVPN, first session, and then short after, we will do uh, the multi-side one where Max will walk you guys through. It's very, very similar to each other, you will see. Um, in the presentation today. It's just the little details which we want to unveil to you guys and make sure you have that data. I uploaded the PDF into the uh, WebEx app, so if you join that room, you can ask questions, you can download the PDF, or the PDF for this session is also available on the, on the app somewhere else. Uh, when you look at the session, you can download it there and have a look at it. Um, agenda, a little bit of introduction. What is multi-site, use cases, a deeper look on it, and I'll go and jump right away into the introduction because it's, I think, just one slide. Um, that's what we're going to talk about, right? We're going to have a brief touch point on the standards area. We're going, uh, what is multi-site about, use cases, and then the essence of the BGW or the border gateway in this multi-site architecture. And here we go, ready to go. You guys are good? Too much CCIE party yesterday? If you still recoup, it's good to jump right away in the party tonight. And I'm 100% confident the videos and pictures don't land anywhere because what, is, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And I think more recently on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or whatever you want to know, that's why we go out without phones all the time. So what is multi-site? Now, in order to give you a little bit of uh, history, why we did multi-site is um, we need a layer two data center interconnect, we need a layer three data center interconnect. Um, actually, Max always says DCI is dead because we want to make it a part of the fabric itself that you can just structure, extend segments as you need. Now, all the way back in the time, we started building uh, what was called the DCI EVPN overlay draft. And the DCI EVPN overlay draft was there to interconnect multiple EVPN islands with different interconnectivity. Great. But as all or most of the EVPN drafts, that was only layer two. So great base. We co-authored it. We pushed it through. We made it a standard. But it was a layer two part only. Now when we say layer two, how did it look as from a RFC 9014 or the DCI EVPN overlay draft. Are they dancing over there? Or? Wow. Um, we said we want to interconnect different islands. You see here we have a left island, a right island, different ASs. We want to have only one address family in between or one address family exchange in between, different encapsulations at that point. So we want to do something like, let me see if that pointer is going to work. Okay, not on the screen. So we want to do something like tunnel stitching, and tunnel stitching happens at the gateway. So that's more or less what uh, 9014 um, defines. Click. Here we go. In 9014, it's also defined two different modes of building these interconnections. Um, one is a very traditional mode, which is called the decoupled gateway, section three in that RFC, which basically says, hey, you have 
one, what do, what do they call it? You have the gateway and you have the DC edge and you just put VLANs in between and be done with it. I think we did that for so many years. Great to do. If you want something a little bit more fancy, we're talking about the integrated gateway where we basically have an ingress tunnel, tunnel splitting, and then we have an egress tunnel. And that's basically what is being there defined without the layer three aspect. So what are we doing with layer three then? Do you guys do DCI for layer two only? Layer two, layer three? Yeah, right? What about it? So we had to do a little bit of work and we filed a draft. Um, one of my coworkers, um, the draft Sharma multi-site eVPN was initially there and then we added it with the working group notation which is best for BGP enabled services. And in the meantime, we rewrote it to a very later stage somewhere in version two Make sure you look at the best one on the top and not the precursor of it, which is being obsolete. Um, we, ha we have two versions going, 0, 1, and 2, actually 3. And then um, from the previous one, we had uh, a couple of versions. So we're in version 7, more or less, in there. And we have all of these different thoughts of what RFC 9014 covers in there, because we believe it's extensive and great. And we added the layer 3 use case. And we added another use case, which is all about scaling out, building bigger cluster, which we call an anycast approach. So we have a little bit of a different mutation of gateways, and I will show you these different mutations of gateways in this presentation today. So multi-site by the standards bodies is not just layer two, it's layer two and layer three. So it's complementing the RFC 9014 instead of competing with anything going on there. I mean, why would we compete with a RFC which we wrote on our own? It makes totally no sense, right? But some people feel it makes sense that we compete with our own. Now, to give you an overview, what are the differences or what the similarities, table, eye chart, for your reference, by the way. I'm not going to the different lines. What I want to call out is the route type 5 handling, eVPN RT5, not part of RFC 9014, part of multi-site solution, cool. And then the other piece is under the RFC 9014, everything is overlay and underlay ECMP. That means you need for every ECMP two resources, one underlay, one overlay. We decided to continue with that option as well when we just go in that what we call multi-path PIP. PIP is for primary IP address. Or we just disable that, use a virtual IP address, make uh, an any cast out of there and have just uh, overlay, sorry, an underlay balancing at that point, because for us it's always the same neighbor. What do we achieve with these differences? Scale convergence is different, because I don't have to do a lot of elections across different areas if one disappears. It's literally no disappearance for us at that point. So here in a nutshell, side by side, 9014 is purely layer two. It has um, two gateway model, the integrated and non-integrated or decoupled. Multi-site is basically extending on top of that. RFC 904 is our sister, brother, father, daughter, uh, whatever you want to call it. We add layer three on it, and we extend the um, BGW models or the border gateway models with uh, VIP mode, which gives us the scale, the convergence, and optimizes the ECMP part. Anyone has a question? Are you guys standard compliant? Do I answer that? Are you guys good with that? No? Yes? Good? No? Can we go into use cases? Are you guys good? Okay. If anyone wants to talk about RFC, please come in the front. Um, I, have a, I have a spot here. We'll talk about it for the next time. Use cases, very important. And I want to give you an overview on where we came from. Why do we build these gateways. And some of you were in an interactive session um, earlier this week. I think we had only 30 people. I think now it's like 300. So it's not easy to have a very interactive conversation with all of you guys here. But um, come see us later uh, at that point and we have more of that. But when we, when we did the use cases, the first one was how do I better isolate and compartmentalize a single data center, single geographical data center with multiple data halls, multiple application requirements. So basically, a better multi-part. 
if you want to call it that way. And now I'm not saying that in regards of ACI multipod, I'm saying that in regards of the classic concept of building one humongous large fabric, one single overlay domain, but multiple ASs, because it doesn't really do much other than uh, giving you a lot of work and headache to work around. So we built this, and you can literally extend your layer two, layer three, both or only one from wherever you want to wherever you want in between these different compartments within a data center, within a geographic location. Another, um, sorry, in, in that, op in, sorry, <laughs> I lost my point. Um, in that part of compartmentalization, there is optimization of traffic, which we also want to achieve. So one of it is the obvious storm control we have for layer two extension, where we can suppress um, broadcasts or rate limit broadcast on a unicast or multicast, that's there. And then on top of that, we try to give you a better replication model that if you decide to use ingress replication in your fabrics, I give you actually a much better experience uh, cross or between these different fabrics. So let's look at it uh, from a traditional uh, multipod perspective or what we call a single fabric on the left. You have the leaf here on the very left which has to do ingress replication and if this is one big ass fabric, pardon my French, uh, you do n times replication meaning ev to every other VTAP which has that layer two segment installed. So in that case, the poor leaf on the very left has to do how many replications? One, two, three, four, five, right? It's a small diagram. Think of it how many switches you potentially have in your data center where the layer two is stretched and where you have to do the replication and you do the math. And not only do the math, also look at how much bandwidth just that ingress replication will use. Now, in the case of multi-site, we replicate within the site or within the fabric from leaf to all the neighbor leaves. The border gateway is also a neighbor leaf. We terminate, we create one copy, send it across one, and then we fan out on the border gateway again for the leaves in the remote side. And when you look at this, you can see that the interconnect between the different fabric has massively optimized, so you don't have a huge replication of unnecessary traffic there. You add storm control to that, you add um, uh, ARP proxy to that, or what is it called, ARP suppression, and you actually have not really L2 anymore, you optimized L2 the heck out of what you can, um, but still keep the same subnet communication going. Another piece we had in mind was scale. Everyone talks about, I wanna have a big network. Thousands of switches. Great, I'll give you thousands of switches, I actually give you slightly more than thousands of switches, I give you 32,768 VTAPs. Is that enough? It's 256 switches per fabric multiplied by 128 fabric, that's what multi-site does today. So instead of building one big fabric where the single switch here, the, the leaf on the very left, is the poor guy who has to figure out all the other guys, and we have an n square minus one problem, which is full mesh, which will happen with the tunnel, we're going to create smaller entities, smaller scale entities, height the border gateways from each other, and then let border gateway to border gateway talk, and with this, reduce the amount of the n square minus one or the full mesh, which is happening from within the fabric and between the border gateways and nothing more. So when you look at this, um, just give you here the single fabric again versus the multiple fabric, just to, to get you the VTAP um, thoughts around on how the traffic patterns work, you see here, if uh, leaf one wants to communicate, it communicates directly with all the other leaves. So the remote VTAPs or the neighbor VTAPs, it says is five, right? So the count is five. And the other side, the count is three within fabric one. The count is one between the two sides and the count is four within the fabric there. So you optimized your amount of remote sessions quite a lot. You guys get that? All works, yes? Boring, done. Uh, third one, DCI. That's why I didn't talk about initially the compartmentalization, the scale. We do DCI as well, data center interconnect. What you need between these sites is IP reachability, MTU, and what? Pretty much nothing else, because we don't care on anything else. We can use ingress replication between the sites. You saw the optimization we can do. The MTU, you actually don't really need a higher MTU if you can bring the MTU down on your servers, but 
I'll say you need a higher MTU. 1500 plus 50 or 54 bytes in order to accommodate VXLAN when you want to do non-jumbo. If you go jumbo frames, you go 9000 plus 50 or 54. Given switches today do 9216, you have plenty of space to fit in your large scale IP storage protocols or whatever else they are uh, from an MTU perspective. So works within a geographic location between two, uh, two data centers within 50 miles or 50 kilometers. It works across the whole globe. So there is not a real issue. And remember, uh, a real issue of route trip times or anything like that, because that's an application problem. You remember how um, the internet was built. It's built based on BGP. Welcome to the world. This is BGP, right? So we, we do the same thing, so you're not being bound to some um, vendor-specific protocols for exchanging data. And by the way, this is true for ACI as well as VXLAN EVPN here in NXOS, because both of them are using VXLAN EVPN for multi-site, meaning between different sites at that point. Use case number four, integration with legacy. Legacy is everything which is not VXLAN EVPN. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm legacy too, by the way. I'm working on Fabric Path still today. Um, it's basically how can I attach a traditional network you might have, and I'm pretty sure you all have some CAT 6Ks in the data center, or maybe some 7Ks, some 5Ks, Fabric Path, Ethernet, you name it. So you can attach that to a set of border gateway distribute the gateway across, and you can keep not this not just for migration, but for the coexistence until you retire your whole legacy network at that point, and you can con continue from there on. Use case five is hybrid, hybrid clouds, and it's not only hybrid cloud from on-prem up into the public cloud, so we can extend VXLAN EVPN layer three only. I want to be very specific to the public cloud. Um, you can put a CSR or CAT8 KV up there, and they do VXLAN EVPN up there too. And then we can also do that between different cloud providers in a true multi-cloud area. And we announced this week uh, something called the Cisco Cloud Network Controller, which is actually managing everything up in the public cloud. Works very well with NDFC, the Nexus Dashboard Fabric Controller on-prem. And you can build your, uh, if you want to call it this way, your multi-site fabric across on-prem data center, a private cloud, and public cloud. A breath. We're still good in time, I think. Multi-site, a deeper look. So I gave you the use cases, I gave you the standards, now we look at it a little bit further. And these are all the hardware platforms that support the border gateway function. This is only relevant for the border gateway. The leaves, I don't care what you use. Just don't call me if you want to see the config of it. I only know my configs, meaning some of the Cisco ones. Um, but I don't really care what your leaves are. Border gateways here, hard requirement. And when you look at the vast amount of boxes, it's pretty much every switch we have in the data center. Is any, anyone, is any switch missing here from a 9K perspective? Anyone says 9400, not yet shipping. Everyone's, anyone saying 9800, not yet shipping, but bear with me. The other one is the NXOS version. We start 703i71 in 2017. Today we are at 1023f, I think, is the latest version. So we added hardware as the hardware showed up. We added and baked it into NXOS as it showed up. But literally, you have a five-year feature implementation in our code, and we always hardened on scale, and we hardened on convergence, and we made sure new features come in, new use cases come in. And by the way, all of you guys in the last couple of years when we met at Cisco Lives or other, you gave us these use cases, or these features, or these ideas. So it's not that we sit somewhere in a corner and don't uh, do our own thing. We want to hear from you guys what you guys are doing, so please use the WebEx app if you can, and give some suggestions if you have. Number of sites, very recently we had 25, 128. Massive scale increase, right? Well, it's just simple to simulate these pieces at that point. Border gateway per site, six. We tap within a site, 256. And now I had to start separate the table a little bit with the, uh, with the VRF, VNI scale, um, with the uh, route scale, because we have a certain set of platforms which have a much higher capacity on I don't want to say TCAM, but hardware tables, and that's what you see with the FX, FX3, GX, and GX2, where you see double the scale 
in pretty much, or more than double the scale, in pretty much every of the route areas, all the way up to 1.1 million. Actually, it's a little bit more, but we want to be conservative. The other piece which we increased is when you look at the layer three VNIs, previously we had 900, we're now at 2,000. So it's the maximum which we currently support is 2,000. And VLANs, 3,900. And now you guys probably ask, why not 4,000 or 4,096? Simply, there's some reserved VLANs within the platform. Uh, I removed them, so 3,900 is the approximate number of layer two extension you can put on a um, multi-site gateway or multi-site border gateway or on a leaf today. By the way, the same numbers you see here, these are leaf numbers. So leaf or border gateway doesn't really make a difference to me. It's literally just a special leaf. And that's what I want to re-emphasize as we go forward in the presentation here. So some notes um, in regards to the border gateway as we talk about them right now, right? The switch we had, the hardware, the software, the scale. So these are these, these funny boxes there uh, in blue with the BGW uh, denotation. So it's a, a tunnel stitcher. Um, we have an intrafabric tunnel which comes from the leaf to the border gateway when I want to exit. I have a tunnel between border gateway and border gateway, and then I have another tunnel on the remote side going down. Our tunnel stitching happens in hardware. No recirculation at line rate. So you should not see any latency increase at all when you're performing or using this feature versus just going through one of our cloud scale switches. Now, how do we build some of these pieces um, around and what are key criteria to make this work? I'll show you here the green table and the yellow table, or orange, and these are two different fabric underlays. Fabric one doesn't know about fabric two. Fabric two doesn't know about fabric one. If you feel it should be the same IP addressing in that underlay, go crazy. I don't want to troubleshoot it, but go crazy, it works. No issue, we test that. It's just a little bit more difficult to identify which fabric, which, which, which leaf, right? But they don't need to talk to each other at all from an underlay perspective. Again, underlay is infrastructure, there's no server or anything in there, so it stays down there. Between the sites, you have to align a certain set of IP addresses, and that certain set of IP addresses we call the virtual IPs, or VIPs, and the primary or individual IP addresses, which are the PIPs. Why do they need to align to each other? If they're the same, they cannot talk to each other, right? Duplicate IP will not work, so we have to make sure they, they are unique in that set, in that multi-site underlay to communicate in between. Now, this said, let me go a little bit into both the border gateway deployment considerations. We have two types of border gateways. We have an Anycast border gateway, we have a VPC border gateway. Yeah, what did these guys smoke? Why not just one? Um, I, I always take the blame on this one. Um, I actually would say that we have four border gateway models because we can run each of them in VIP mode and in PIP mode, meaning overlay ECMP versus no overlay ECMP. But on the end, the, the idea, going, coming through that in a couple of subsequent slides, is that you have a stitching point and that you have a flexibility depending on what your use case is at that border gateway level. And in the case of any cast, you have a scale out of six nodes, which is a shared nothing between them. I mean, shared nothing is literally, it's the same AS, the same IP, and they exchange BGP. So they don't share any heartbeat protocols or anything like that. And as I said, you have uh, two modes of operation in there. You have the uh, Cisco optimized performance scale mode, or you have the third party interoperable mode, and the difference is literally one command, uh, which is the DCI pip command at that point. The VPC border gateway looks a little bit different. It's only two. VPC is always a, a, a pair in that case. And the reason why we brought that in is if you want to attach a layer two ethernet network underneath, and you already use something like MCLAG or VPC or VSS or chassis redundant Ethernet connections, we want to use that attachment point here. Another point is network services like firewalls, where you probably, maybe, I don't know, want to have a port channel from your firewall to both of these switches as an exit point. So we give you that flexibility uh, with the given criteria on what one border gateway can do versus what the other border gateway can't do. 
So this is a side to side. Um, you see very uh, upfront the differences, any CAS border gateway versus a VPC border gateway. They look different when you look at the red box and you see the differences in the deployment scenarios they have. You can't attach a host to an AnyCast border gateway. You don't have a layer two port, a dot one Q trunk or an SVI on the AnyCast border gateway, it doesn't exist. It's a pure gateway which only learns from remotes, local or external. On the right hand side, the VPC border gateway, you can attach hosts, you can attach firewalls, you can attach whatever you want there. And it is a transit to the VTABs, to the leaves underneath, or um, to a remote site at that point. Does that help a little bit to understand where we're coming from, why we have these two different modes of border gateways? Would one be enough? Should we make four more? I have some ideas like double stack, triple, triple chocolate chip with some cream in the middle or so, but we leave that on the side. Um, given I threw a lot of comments around about that common underlay between the two border gateways, between, between the multiple sites, I want to show you what are the IP addresses you really have to make sure they're unique. They're unique for all the leaves in the fabric and they're unique for in between the sites. And one is the multi-site VIP, the 10011 and then the PIPs, the primary IP or the individual IP addresses of each border gateway. So we need to talk to each border gateway individually, why? Well, we want to create a B2B session, right? When you do an Anycast IP address B2B session, you have one session, we want to have four sessions, we want to get all of them involved in this. So we have that cluster. We also want to do DF election, designated forward election, so only one is per VLAN forwarding uh, broadcast down on unicast or multicast packets, bum. What would happen if all would forward and all would receive? The loop. We don't want that. On the other side, you have the VPC border gateway. And we said the VPC border gateway is nothing else than a leaf with VPC plus a multi-site IP address on top. So it looks very much the same as every other leaf you would deploy. The main difference is you have an external DCI fabric interface and you have a multi-site uh, IP address uh, which uh, hides all the leaves which are behind there. But apart from that, it's pretty much the same. Quick question, Quick question over there. One second. I'm hearing impaired from yesterday evening. Can those two modes Absolutely. Absolutely. So, can these two modes interoperate? Can I have in one fabric an Anycast and the other fabric a VPC? Yes. And even more. Can one be a VPC and the other one an Anycast in RFC 9014 mode? Yes, it can as well. And then there's one more on top, and sorry for that one. We have CloudSec encryption, which is VXLAN tunnel encryption. So we do that in the VPC border gateway mode as well as in the Anycast border gateway mode, and they can talk together as well. So you have um, forth and back. And sorry to give you one more answer to that one. Apologize. There's a lot of information we can give you. You can even run on two border gateways, CloudSec, and the third one doesn't understand CloudSec, and we just don't encrypt between these two. So we have all of these auto negotiation of capabilities purely based on BGP EVPN standards. No craziness, right? I'm not doing super smart TLVs or sub options or anything like that, which you will never find in any other protocol. I'm just using what the standard gives us. Okay, let me try to get back up here. Oh. Too much exercise for today. Control and data plane. I know we do a packet walk tomorrow, if you guys can make it. Hope the party is good tonight. Dave Matthews band, what else? I think that's it. Something more? Okay, is that any good? Sorry, um, I'm, I'm ignorant, apologize. <laughs> um, Control and data plane, I want to go through that. Um, BGP has something called next hop. If we peer with a neighbor from one AS into the different AS, what changes? The next hop, right? eBGP has a traditional next hop rewrite, rewrite behavior. So what we're doing is we're basically reoriginating these routes with a different next hop, and as a result, we're creating this uh, three set of topology 
So leaf goes to border gateway, border gateway to border gateway, border gateway to leaf. So the next hops are being rewritten as well, always when you go from hop to hop at that point. What do we use for loop protection? We use the AS path, and that's exactly the reason why your fabric one should have a different AS than your fabric two, because then we can clearly delimit that source AS is never equals to destination AS, and you will never have any kind of loop craziness going on in case of a failure. The other thing we recommend, I want to be very specific, we recommend is that your fabrics run in IBGP from an overlay perspective. By the way, that's where VPN address families come from. And in between, we run EBGP, so we call that model IEI. Otherwise, you have like 10 ASs in Fabric 1 and 10 ASs in Fabric 2. You have to make sure they don't overlap with what is ever in between. But anyway, we support also EEE. EBGP, EBGP, EBGP. There is one little crooks with that. When you run EBGP as an underlay protocol and use EBGP in between the sides, what happens automatically? All the IP addresses of my leaves, my underlay addresses of my leaves, will be advertised to the remote side. You remember that underlay isolation I showed you with the yellow and the green table where one doesn't see the other one and only in the one to a couple in the middle know of each other? That's what we want to have. We don't want to know about them. And the reason I also gave you could be overlap in IP addresses or different isolation criteria. So in the EEE, we need to go and figure out and make sure that you filter the right addresses out because per default, BGB just sends everything true. Works, in my lab at least. We have configs, we have customers doing it. And every time they call said, hey, I have a defect, I have a bug, it doesn't work. And say, yes, your route map over there filters out the PIP address of, of the border gateway and not really funny. So just think about these operational tasks which are coming in. Um, we require to use a full mesh between all border gateways from an EVPN overlay address family perspective. If you don't want to do that, you can put something in the middle which is called a route server. It's control plane only. It's nothing else than a route reflector, an EBGP route reflector if you want so. It reduces the amount of BGP session you have to do. Um, think of it, 128 sites, six border gateways per site. You do a full mesh, do the math, how many BGP sessions you have to go and set up by hand. Route server in the middle, couple of them, two. Problem solved, you always put peer to two of them. Uh, by the way, um, when you look at NDFC, Nexus Dashboard Fabric Controller, or DCNM uh, before, we automate full mesh, and we automate also route server completely. So uh, we configure your route server if you tell us which one it is. And again, the dating network. Who was in one of my earlier sessions for external connectivity? So VXLAN EVPN is a dating network, right? It's where the control plane meets the data plane, and when they meet together, we get routes, and we get tunnels. And that's how things uh, progress little fabrics at the end. Um, and it all starts with a network device. Now here, differently. When you saw the other session, I showed the network device and I attached the host directly. I don't want to do this here, so this network device is now uh, becoming, at a point, our border gateway. Bear with me. But we have a fabric behind that network device, so it's something special going on there. We put a VTAP on top of that. It's still a switch, it's still a router still a network device, still an edge device, but we make him with that VTAP, we make it a virtual, virtual, virtual network virtualization edge, holy, can I say that? A network virtualization edge, and that network virtualization edge becomes a special vir network virtualization edge, meaning a border gateway, when there is another special uh, network virtualization edge on the other side, and there is a whole fabric behind that, which is also BGW. So only if there are two of them talking to each other, stitching these tunnels together, only then they're a border gateway. When they go external word, we call them border. The gateway part is we are stitching tunnels. We're stitching between local VTAP L, between remote VTAP B, and um, Everything which is in fabric two in the yellow side, I don't care what the leaves are. I really don't care. That's why they're not here on the slide. I really don't care. The host needs to talk to leaf. The leaf needs to talk to border gateway. The border gateway needs to talk to border gateway. And then what's behind that, I don't know, will be uh, going into the fabric at that point. We have tables. 
Um, you see here an empty table, you see a MAC table, you see a IP or a, sorry, a RIP, a FIP table, routing information base, forwarding information base. What table you don't see here? What is another table? Anyone? ARP? Oh yeah, great, great point. So no ARP. I come here from an Anycast border gateway, so no host attachment, no layer two. So we just have MAC addresses and we have uh, routes in that case. So let's assume we get from Fabric2, for whatever reason, a route. So we're sending a BGP update, getting some type five. Don't know why it's a type five, it's a prefix route. There must be so something attached there which creates that network. And as we receive that route, we're going to import that into the VRF. So route target, import into the VRF configured on the border gateway. And as we import this, we also will reoriginate this. So we do an export in eVPN and send it to all the other leaves within the fabric which might be interested of that VRF. They respectively will get that BGB update. They will respectively download it with the respective route target. Now, one thing I want you to look at very, very specifically. What is the IP address of the next stop on the border gateway? 10.0.2.1. That's what we got from the remote border gateway. You can see that. Border gateway rewrote it when it came into the fabric. And now on the leaf, it's 10.0.1.1, which is basically the IP address of the border gateway within uh, VTAP interface, the multi-site VIP. Classic BGP, right? It's exactly how BGP would work in any eBGP case when you do these next top rewrites. Um, I do the same just for the sake of uh, completeness with uh, route type two. Uh, remote side has a host coming up, a host ARPs. Route type two is uh, MAC IP route. So we have MAC address slash 48. We have an IP address slash 32. We have now two VNIs. We have our labels. We have uh, two route targets, one for the routing table, one for the MAC table, and we still have the 1002 next top in there. So we do the VRF import, MAC VRF on the top, IP VRF on the bottom. We do an export, a redistribute, an advertise, a reoriginate, whatever you want to call it. I just use them interchangeably. And then we send it down uh, with BGP to the leaf. And you see, again, we rewrote the next top to 10.0.1.1. Now, in the case of routing of VXLAN, you always have an inner MAC header. So you need something kind of filled in there. So in the routing case, we have something called the router MAC. And you see the router MAC uh, X1, X1, blah, 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 is the border gateways one there, and X2, X2, X2 is the remote border gateway. So that's just the inner um, header completion for the routing information. I'll show you that in a second. But as you see, this is like you would see it for in a fabric from leaf to leaf. It looks pretty much the same, or leaf to border. Right? It's just that we now have two eVPN domains or three eVPN domains or 128 eVPN domains which we're dealing with. Now, back to the dating network, when we take all of these information, we have two entries, right? We have a 10.10.0 subnet from remote. We have a 192.168.112, which host A is, I guess. I can't remember, honestly. Yeah, it's probably that guy. Um, is it? 112. 112 is remote, 012 is local. So host 12 is 012. So here we want to route from host A towards um, another host, which is 192.168.112. Um, we send it out on the leaf. We do the, all the encapsulation. You see the router MAC, the source MAC, A1, A1, A1. That's the leaf. You see the destination MAC, X1, X1, X1 is the border gateway. We have the outer SIP and DIP. 1111 for the uh, leaves. IP address DIP uh, is the destination IP address. It's the VIP of the border gateway. So we send it in that direction. This is just a normal VXLAN packet from one VTAP to the other VTAP. Now the magic happens. Now we're going to rewrite necessary information and that's where the tables come in and that's where the routing information from uh, eVPN come in. You see the source IP changed when we go from border gateway to border gateway. 10.0.1.1 to 10. Uh, 021, so these are the two border gateways in that case. You see the next stop, 10021, down there for 192.168.112. Sorry, I cannot point, it doesn't, it doesn't do it. And then as a result, we are, we are updating the respective outer dips and we are making sure the inner stays the same. But the source MAC and the destination MAC in the inner VXLAN header are being rewritten to border gateway one's MAC address, router MAC address to destination MAC of border gateways to or remote border gateways destination MAC. 
Remember, this is routing. I never need to know the source host's MAC address and routing. That's the whole point of it. But if you have an Ethernet frame and you route from one interface to the other interface, you do a MAC rewrite on every hop, right? So classically, what you do in an IP point-to-point, -point, you do in an overlay the same way. If you want bridging, so R, red, routing, B, blue, bridging, um, we take the MAC tables here. You see again, we have 1111. Uh, which is host A, we have 10021, which is a host somewhere uh, outside. So we come from outer SIP to DIP, that's the VXLAN outer header, VNI 30001, layer two VNI. We keep the 100A, which is the MAC address of host A, want to talk to 100B or 15 to 112, depending on if you are layer two or layer three. So we send it to packet, the VXLAN packet over to the border gateway. We rewrite, and now you can see the only thing we rewrite is the outer headers, meaning the source IP and the destination IP. The inner MAC header stays the same. Because we do bridging, we need to see the original MAC address, and we need to talk to the MAC address which we really want to talk to, or the IP address in the same subnet at that point. OK, I went fast. We have a little bit of time to repeat this if you guys want. You guys are good? Should I go a couple of steps back? Go through? I see an arm going up there. Yes? Is that a yes? Or is it just a question? Sorry, I can't hear you. What about outer mech? If I'm in a routed network, why do I care about the outer mech? Of course. I mean, in the underlay, there is classic routing happening, but from a tunnel, um, I don't really care. So what I care is the source IP to destination IP that I go there from an outer header perspective. And yes, if I go from leaf to spine to a border, you will rewrite that on a hop by hop from an outer Mac perspective. Um, what I want to emphasize here is it doesn't have a relevance to it. Uh, when we think of VXLAN in the, in the tunnel sense, it has a relevance to the underlay itself or how IP packet in a traditional network are being routed. So yes, you're out, right. Outer Macs are being changed in bridging and in routing because VXLAN is an IP tunnel over the top, right? But from uh, a real relevance for us here, the SIPs and the DIPs of the outer are, the VTAP IP addresses are the most important pieces to follow. You're very welcome. There's another question back there. I hope I can hear you. Can you talk a little more about the um, different use cases for the NEPS border gateway and the VPC? Uh, yes, yes. I'll, 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 I'll give you just a short, brief addition on the AnyCast border gateway versus the VPC border gateway. And I think then we have to jump forward. Otherwise, you guys ding me for uh, not finishing in time, and I don't want that. You, you guys will ding me anyway. I'm, I'm OK at that. Accent, noisy room, too cold. Um, VPC border gateway, integration with legacy network, attachment of firewalls or other network services, brownfield. These are the, the main key points for VPC border gateway. Anycast border gateway, scale, convergence, um, no attachment, share nothing, individuality, con uh, convergence, as I said, scale, uh, what else? The greenfield, these are the ones which you have in your, in your um, toolbox for, um, for any CAS border gateway. And I think one thing is to say, and we say that when we, when we sometimes do a migration story or a migration session, um, if you start with VPC border gateways because you want to do a migration at the point where you don't have a legacy network anymore and no attachment to the VPC border gateway, consider to convert them into any CAS border gateway because it just gives you more, um, more way to go for, further if you have a need for that um, in your network deployment and your network design. So we're going into the conclusions. <laughs> and in there, there are two main things. Uh, the border gateway is key. You can call multi-site Bob or Pete. It doesn't matter how you call it. The border gateway, the function of the border gateway is the most essential piece. I'm sure there are other vendors coming up with other names, like multi-domain or whatever else they want to call it. 
Um, the border gateway has a specific function and that's what makes this stitching of tunnels work and that's what um, you need to take care of where you want to place them in what mode and how they operate. That's, that's the key. So always think, where do I do the tunnel stitching? Why do I do the tunnel stitching? The use cases, et cetera, right? That's, that's what you want to focus as conclusion point number one. And then the influence of which border gateway you choose, is it VPC, is it Anycast? I gave you a slide on that one, it's in there, and a little emphasis afterwards. The second piece is, when you want to go to multi-site, it's not difficult to add a border gateway. You just add another VTAP, right? And then you just have to do the plumbing to the other side and add another VTAP there. Hello, we are border gateways, we talk to each other and we're good to go. It's there for quite a while. I, th I think I said 2017, so five-ish years or so. Um, where we are around in the market with this, and we're focusing on layer two, layer three extension, complementary to RFC 9014, and we have pretty much every hardware platform, which is Nexus 9000, has the support of being a border gateway with different scale numbers, which I showed you. And from a deployment perspective, supported topology, there's a white paper out there. We have a next-gen DCI white paper for replacing OTV if you want, and we have uh, another white paper for how to deploy basically the Anycast border gateways extensively. I'll post them into the room. Resources for NXOS, actually, these are the white papers, and then for the IETF if you wanna go and read. Thanks a lot for being with me. Please give me survey feedback, appreciate it. Hope to see you guys tomorrow morning in my session, in Max's session and do whatever you like for the remaining time here. Make sure your voice doesn't sound like mine because it's, it hurts. Have a good one, guys. Talk to you later.